Well, in this final video, we're going to take a look at how some of these various ideas, whether they be the actual gospel itself, whether they be some of those heresies, some of the outright cults, we're going to see how they began to affect art and literature. And really, we're just going to take a look at how art and literature progress. We'll begin with the literary side. I'm going to take you through a few key American authors, and the first is Washington Irving. Now, we could, of course, spend a long time looking at Washington Irving, but we're just going to kind of survey these characters today. Now, Irving himself is famous for writing such uh, works as The Legend of Sleepy Hollow or the story of Rip Van Winkle. And the thing about Irving was Irving was someone who had traveled to Europe, had greatly seen the European capitals, had fell in love with the traditions of Europe, which really meant he had fallen in love with Christianity itself. And even though he sometimes wasn't always the most orthodox of believers, he was someone who understood the whole concept of the fairy tale, the whole concept that you actually often have divine intervention in a story, and there always has to be some type of divine justice. And so Irving really invented the American fairy tale, which is why his works are still highly readable and enjoyable to this day. The second author I want you to note was a man by the name of James Fenimore Cooper. Cooper, who also lived in western New York, is famous for his leather stocking tales. And these are tales that re revolve around the character of Natty Bumpo. And the most famous, of course, is Last of the Mohicans. Now, Cooper was someone who loved the frontier. He loved in many ways the practices and the culture of the natives. But he himself was a committed Christian who felt called to civilization, who felt called to the building of the city, who felt called really to a high liturgy, a high form of worship in his regular weekly covenant renewal services. And so Cooper really is a great romantic. He's someone who is in his stories you think when you're reading them, oh, it really couldn't happen this way necessarily, but you don't really care. They're beautifully crafted tales that always have a creation, they always have a fall, but they always have a redemption. And so Cooper was able to show what the great American novel could really look like. However, because the culture changed its course, because we began to pursue heretical ideas, literature also took a turn. And we find that in men such as Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne, who came from Salem, Massachusetts, and was actually related to one of the judges who oversaw the Salem witch trials and hated that fact all of his life, was someone who really turned away from Puritan ideals. In fact, I'll call him the secular Puritan. He, of course, is famous for his novel, The Scarlet Letter, and even though he was someone who loved the ideals of the Puritans, he did not love the God of the Puritans. And so he had this notion that there needs to be confession. There needs to be the revealing of sin. That's why many of his stories actually revolve around whether or not you show forth who you actually are. But the problem was he was always looking for something beyond the gospel or something different than the gospel. He often suggests there will be a new revelation or that love itself is the answer to humanity's problems. Of course, love is the answer, but it's always related to God's actual divine love, which satisfies his divine justice. The next character we'll take a look at is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, another New Englander, a great poet who wrote things like the Song of Hiawatha, or most famously, Paul Revere's Ride. He also came from a Puritan background. He also had those Puritan values, but he was a Unitarian. He did not believe that Jesus was God. He believed that we had to find solutions to this world's problems and to our own problems, well, on our own. And so he wrote things like this. This is called A Psalm of Life, what the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Listen as I read this to you. Tell me not in mournful numbers life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. 
Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle and the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within, and God or head. In other words, what he argues is that it's the heart within itself that actually has to liven us. It's the heart within that actually has to act in this world and act justly. Of course, it's a noble sentiment. We know that we have to pursue right and just things. But the question is, what is behind you that causes you to pursue those things? Now, the final author, and probably the most famous of these men, is Edgar Allan Poe, who came from Virginia, who had a rather uh, dark background, and also wrote rather dark tales and poetry. He's most famous for works such as The Tell Tale Heart, or The Fall of the House of Usher, or The Raven. And Poe is someone who's quite intriguing. Because Poe, even though he seems to be so sad in much of what he writes, even though you even sense a bit of bitterness, you always get a sense of justice. Poe always had, has a great notion of what sin is, and he always has this great notion that there has to be something beyond. It's just that Poe never quite gets there. In fact, let me read to you a section of Poe's work from Annabel Lee, his most famous, one of his most famous works. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs in heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. In other words, he's someone who refuses to forget the causes of sin, or refuses to forget the effects of sin, but he also refuses to turn to pleasure as an actual solution to these things. And so with Poe, even though you encounter this darkness, you always encounter the first half of the gospel. Now, incredibly, the way that painting or the visual arts, the course that it took, shows a remarkable return in many ways to the gospel itself. In fact, most famously during the first half of the, of the 19th century, we have the Hudson River School. These characters, these men who painted magnificent landscapes and who were really, who were both romantics and realists, meaning they painted things to make them look realistic. They painted things that were actually there, but they always managed to give it some type of romantic uh, lens of, to which to view it by. These men were really kind of the first rock stars in American history. They were often the men who made the greatest amounts of money and who uh, enjoyed some of the greatest fame whenever they traveled from city to city. What's incredible about the Hudson River School artist is they all viewed nature as an astonishing show of the hand of God. These were men that even though they often were friendly with the transcendentalist, many of them were actually orthodox believers. In other words, when they looked at nature, they didn't see something that was simply marvelous, which of course it is, but they saw something that revealed a higher power, that revealed an actual God who had spoken partially through nature, but who had especially spoken through his word. And so when they made these magnificent portraits, some of them, some of these landscapes that are actually more than 20 feet wide, they made them in many ways as a protest to many of the ideas of the age. After all, this was a time when evolution proposed by Charles Darwin was taking hold in American universities. This is a time when they were saying that this world that we live in has been made simply by chance happenings. But of course, Hudson River School artists were able to say, well then how do you explain this beautiful scene? And so, for example, we have works such as The Oxbow by Thomas Cole. Now, The Oxbow, which you see here, is a grandiose painting. It's a painting that gives you this beautiful landscape to look at. It gives you something that is much bigger than yourself. It's something that causes you to pause, something that causes you to be still. 
Another example we have is this painting of Niagara Falls by Frederick Edwin Church. Now this incredible work here with its beautiful rainbow and with its seemingly perfect view, it actually took Church some 200 sketches from possibly as many different vantage points to decide which view he was going to take of the falls. But still it showed people what was out there and attracted them to come to these places. Or we also have, for example, his painting of Koto Paxi, which is a great mountain in the Andes, with this dramatic contrast of light and dark, this dramatic contrast of the volcano and this peaceful environment over off to the side. These were works that drew people to other places. Finally, we have these two works by Albert Bierstadt. The first, looking down Yosemite Valley, uh, shows this just incredible view of what was to be found in California, the West. This actually, these paintings were like the early newspapers. They drew people out to the West in the first place. Or his Sierra Nevada painting. What's incredible about both of these works is they have an amazing scale to them. They have an amazing reference point. So you either see animals or you see something that's small that you can imagine how big a human would be next to it. And so you get an idea of the sheer scale and the sheer grandeur of what was out there, even if you never even got to travel there yourself. So these men did an incredible service of bringing the rich resources that America had to the common people, especially in the East and the Midwest, who often didn't have a chance to go out that way. But of course, many pursued this. All of these artists, all these literary carriers, they're incredibly important to understand. They're, they're people that you should pursue in your studies of American history throughout the years to come because they have valuable things to share with us.